11 barrels into first place. Same car DJ won with down here in the year 2000, so we're really trying to make history, but it's just, it won't, it won't meant to be this weekend. Car number 10, Derek Cope, something to miss on the Earnhardt car. Teams spend hours building cars in the shop. They bring them to the track and use them to chase their dreams. But when that car is no longer needed, what happens to it? Race cars and their craftsmanship live on, sometimes for a lot longer than realized. Like individual drivers have stories, so do the cars themselves. They go back to the track for decades, their accomplishments carried with them. Sometimes they fade away in front of everyone. There's a lot of history hidden under the sheet metal. The Daytona 500 is the biggest prize in NASCAR. Winning that race is something a driver carries with them for the rest of their life. The cars are carefully built months ahead of the race. Crews spend hundreds of hours working late nights over the winter, through the holidays, making sure that that car is perfect in every way. Today, every car that wins the race is displayed at the Daytona Museum for a year and treated like a historic artifact. But that hasn't always been the case. Several Daytona 500 winning cars have been passed around teams, destroyed in crashes, and faded into obscurity through mid-pack racing. This car is a special one. It's the car Darrell Waltrip made his NASCAR debut in. But before that, it won the Daytona 500 and was driven by a collection of auto racing's biggest legends. The car was originally built by Holman Moody as a Ford Fairlane in 1967. It was driven in that year's Daytona 500 by Mario Andretti. Mario had won the past two IndyCar championships and was one of America's brightest young drivers at age 26. As an underdog in the ninth Daytona 500, Andretti led 112 laps and beat Fred Lorenzen to win his only NASCAR race. He took home $48,000 in prize money. Then the car was used by a collection of icons. In September 1967, Mario planned to drive the car again in a USAC stock car race in Milwaukee, but had to run a Can-Am race at Bridgehampton instead. To replace him, A.J. Foyt served as a substitute. Foyt started second and also won the race. At the end of 67, Bobby Allison was hired by Holman Moody. In his first race, he won Rockingham with the car. Then he won Asheville Weaverville, then at Middle Georgia. To end the season, he finished second at Montgomery in the car's last race as a Fairlane. In 1968, Ford Torino sheet metal was placed on the chassis, and David Pearson raced it on dirt tracks and short tracks. In 1969, it became a Torino Talladega. The car won 12 races in 68 and 69, as Pearson won back-to-back -back cup championships. When Pearson wasn't driving the car, Holman Moody repainted it and raced it in USAC Stock Car Series. Three-time Indy 500 champ Bobby Unser won with it at Milwaukee in July 1969. The car was then converted to a 1969 Mercury and raced less often between 1970 and 71, used only when the team entered an extra car. At the 1971 Firecracker 400, A.J. Foyt drove it again, but dropped out of the race and finished 38th. At Talladega in August of 71, German F1 racer and four-time Rolex 24 winner Rolf Stommelen was invited to drive the Mercury. In his only NASCAR race, Rolf qualified sixth, but fell out with steering and frame issues. In October 1971, the car was bought by 24-year-old Daryl Waltrip. At Daytona in February of 72, Waltrip crashed the car in the ARCA and Sportsman races, which led to its final body change. It was updated with a 1971 Mercury body. Daryl won a USAC stock car race with it at Nashville in September 1972, beating Bobby Unser and Gordon Johncock. DW raced the car in Cup in 1973 with a best finish of second at Texas World Speedway. He drove it one last time at Daytona in February of 74 in the Sportsman race. On lap 5, he crashed with Jimmy Means. Waltrip later restored the car, and he continues to own it. While the Andretti car ended up in a museum, a lot of Daytona winning cars lived hard lives. Take, for instance, the car Cale Yarborough won with in 1984. Yarborough won the 1983 500, but returned the following year with a brand new car. The Chevy Monte Carlo, owned by Harry Rainier, was fast right out of the gate. He finished second in the Bush Clash, then won the twin 125-mile qualifying race. And in the Daytona 500, Yarborough led a race-high 89 laps, but waited until the last lap to make a slingshot pass around Darrell Waltrip. At the line, it is... 
Yarborough drove the car again at Talladega in May. The race saw 75 lead changes, a record that held until 2010. At the end of an exciting day, Yarborough passed Harry Gant on the last lap and won again. That car was brought back to Daytona in July for the Firecracker 400. Kale led 79 laps and was riding in second near the end, waiting to make another last lap pass on Richard Petty. When a caution came out with three laps to go, however, Kale had to make his move early, and the move didn't stick. Richard Petty is counterattacking. This may be the race that we're looking at here as they sweep up into traffic. A highly dangerous situation. These Coming down the front straight. Here they are, Sam. They will come across the yellow line just about together, but Petty had the lead. As Richard Petty celebrated his 200th win with President Reagan, Kale had to explain why he pitted a lap early and gave up second position to Harry Gant. Then uh, I misread the flag with swingers, and uh, when, when we came down uh, for the caution flag there, I thought the race was over. As it turned out, neither Petty nor Yarbrough would race their cars again. While Petty's car was inducted into the Smithsonian Museum, Yarbrough's was sold to Greg Sachs. This is the car that Kale Yarborough won the Daytona 500 in a year ago. In its second Daytona 500, the car finished sixth with Sachs driving. At Daytona in July, Sachs and the car were entered as an R&D team for Diegard Racing. Diegard hired a Ford engineer away from Bill Elliott's team and spent weeks developing new technology on this car. And even though it had won the Daytona 500 just a year earlier, everyone was amazed how fast it was with Sachs behind the wheel. Greg won by 23 seconds and scored one of the biggest upset wins in NASCAR history. After the race, Diegard took what they learned and returned the car to Sachs. One week later, Greg put the car for sale in a classified ad in Grand National Scene. It was listed for $35,000 without the engine and transmission. The car was bought by Ken Reagan, and he raced it in the 1986 Daytona 500. Reagan finished 21st with it. After crashing the car at Talladega in July of 86, Reagan sold the car and switched to Ford's for 87. Kale's Daytona 500 winning car went missing until 1992, when Joe Nemorowski drove it in the ARCA race at Atlanta in November. And Gary, see that car? That is the car that Kale Yarbrough was driving when Richard Petty won his 200th race. It's got different sheet metal, but that's the car that, that Kale Yarbrough was driving and was beat by Richard Petty. After that last sighting, the car once again disappeared, and its current location is not known at this time. But Kale's car wasn't the only one that lived a hard life in Arca. Derek Cope's win in the 1990 Daytona 500 was another of NASCAR's biggest upsets. He claimed the win when Dale Earnhardt's tire blew with a half a lap to go. Earnhardt has Earnhardt slopping back, something is amiss. What happened to that car after the big win? That Chevy Lumina came back in May 1990, when Cope drove it again at Talladega. Before the race, the driver said the car had a new engine in it, which should have more horsepower than the one he had in February. But the motor blew on lap four. At Daytona in July, Cope's team brought the same car and same motor that won the Daytona 500. After qualifying 18th, Cope made a fast start and was fighting for 7th at the end of lap 1. But as the cars entered the trioval, he made contact with Greg Sachs and set off one of the biggest crashes in NASCAR history. Cope's car was badly damaged but returned to the race and finished 60 laps down in 28th. That car came back and was raced in the 1991 Bush Clash. With nine laps to go, Cope was involved in a three-car wreck with Ricky Rudd and Ken Schrader. Back then, it was common for teams to run the same car in the Bush Clash and the Daytona 500, so Cope's car was repaired and raced again one week later. Looking for its second straight Daytona 500 win, the car never had the same speed as it did a year before. Running ninth with 12 laps to go, Cope was taken out in yet another crash and suffered heavy damage to the rear of the car. In January 1993, Whitcomb Racing went out of business. Its inventory of cars were sold, including the 1990 Daytona 500 winner. The next mention of the car's whereabouts came in late 1995. It was reported that it was then owned by Iowa businessman Larry Clement and raced in Arca. The driver was Bob Hill, a veteran dirt racer who won the 1993 Bush All-Star Series, NASCAR's only touring series on dirt. Now with a Chevy Monte Carlo body on the chassis, Hill drove it to a strong run in the ARCA race at Atlanta in November of 95. A late bump from Mike Skinner, however, sent the car spinning, but he still finished fourth. But the end of the road for this car came in February 1996. On the final lap of the ARCA race at Daytona, Hill was involved in a crash. The car hit the apron in turn one and started flipping. That's Dixon. Oh, there's a car over and over. Wow. 
Is that Bob Hill? Times. Bob Hill. Cope's 1990 Daytona 500 car still exists in its wrecked condition. It was featured in a 2014 episode of American Pickers and was recently on display at the Iowa Hall of Fame and Racing Museum. And a local car dealer here in town bought it, put a local driver in it. He took it back to Daytona in 96 and he flipped her seven times. <laughs> That's what happened. One year after Cope's win in 1990, Ernie Irvin pulled off another surprising win. Irvin drove a Kodak-sponsored Chevy Lumina to beat Dale Earnhardt and Davey Allison. It was only the second win for both Ernie and Morgan McClure Motorsports. That car he was driving was raced again at Talladega in May, where it made contact with Kyle Petty and touched off a massive crash. Mark Martin's car lifts off the ground but does not go over, but this crash is going to involve several cars. Ernie drove that same car at Daytona in July and led 85 laps, but could only finish fifth. Morgan McClure wasn't sentimental about keeping the car and sold both the car and the engine to James Finch. This car that Jeff Purvis is driving won the 1991 Daytona 500 with Ernie Irvin aboard and maybe a few two in a row. Well, you know, that old car has uh, visited Victor Lane here before a couple years ago, and uh, we thought Jeff could take it back again. Uh. Purvis dominated the race and won easily. In 1994, Morgan McClure won their second Daytona 500, this time with Sterling Marlin driving. At the end of 94, Chevy team switched from the Lumina to the Monte Carlo. Instead of putting a new body on the car, Morgan McClure sold it to Johnny Ray, who most know as an early car owner for Dale Earnhardt, and later as the man who drove the big rig around Talladega. Ray wanted the 1994 car for his 17-year-old son Kevin Ray to drive. In the 1995 ARCA race at Daytona, the young driver crashed the defending 500-winning chassis on lap 32. Both the 1991 and 1994 cars have since been restored. While it was once common for 500-winning cars to continue their racing careers, that all changed in 1996. From that point forward, Daytona 500-winning cars were placed on display at the Daytona USA Museum for the following year. Teams were given $100,000 in exchange for losing their car. And because of this, practically all Daytona 500 winning cars since 1996 still exist in their race used condition. But there is one notable exception. When Dale Jarrett won his third Daytona 500 in 2000, he was driving a car with several years of experience. At the time, it was reported that it already won at Talladega in October 1998, earning the $1 million Winston Noble bonus. It won again at the Pepsi 400 at Daytona in July 1999. The chassis also finished second at both Talladega races in 99. It won the 2000 Daytona 500 and then sat in the museum just as it left victory lane. The 88 team's 500 winner has a rich and productive history. It raced seven times, recording one ARCA win, three Winston Cup victories, two seconds, and over $4 million in winnings. But for the next 365 days, it won't race anywhere because it sits here in Daytona, USA. In February 2001, the car was returned to Robert Yates, but surprisingly, they didn't retire the car. After getting it back, they tore it apart and returned it to the track. The next confirmed race for it was the 2003 Daytona 500, when Elliott Sadler drove it. He posted the 20th fastest speed in qualifying, but the car didn't make it to the race. In a Tuesday practice session, Sadler was involved in a crash, and a backup car was needed. Tore up a really good race car. I mean, we were very fast and unfortunate for the m ms car, and that's the same car DJ won with down here in the year 2000, so we're really trying to make history, but it's just, it won't, it won't meant to be this weekend. Later in 2003, Robert Yates sold the car to an ARCA team owned by Bobby Jones. The new team even changed it from a Ford Taurus to a Dodge Intrepid. The car was raced by Greg Sachs at Daytona in 2004. He led 12 laps, but was taken out in a crash with 10 laps to go. One year later, the car was driven by Eddie Mercer, who crashed it on lap 12. The car wasn't mentioned in articles after 2005, so exactly what happened to it is still unclear. But out of all the stories where old race cars end up, one of the best was a car that almost won the Daytona 500. When Dale Jarrett won in 2000, he crushed the underdog dreams of Johnny Benson Jr. Driving a nearly unsponsored Pontiac for Tyler Jett Motorsports, Benson led 39 laps in Tyler Jett chassis number 18. On a restart with four laps to go, Jarrett passed Benson, and Johnny dropped to finish 12th. The car was used again at Talladega in April, Daytona in July, and Talladega again in the fall. 
In the 2001 Daytona 500, Benson drove the car but was uncompetitive, with a sick engine that let go with less than 20 laps remaining. A 7th place finish at Talladega led into another strong run at Daytona in July. Pitt's strategy gave him the lead with 10 laps to go. Dale Earnhardt Jr. passed Benson for the lead with 5 to go. And as Earnhardt scored an emotional win, Benson dropped to 13th. The team used a new car for the next three super speedway races, until that one crashed and burned at Talladega in April 2002, so the team returned to their old chassis number 18 for Daytona in July. But on lap 7, Benson collided with his teammate Ken Schrader and was turned hard into the outside wall. Benson broke three ribs and missed the next two races. The car was destroyed. In 10 races, the chassis had won over $600,000 in prize money. But Johnny didn't want to lose a car that nearly won the Daytona 500, and so in June 2003, he brought the chassis to a junkyard in Statesville, North Carolina, and had it crushed into a cube. Benson brought it back to his home and made a coffee table out of his Pontiac. <laughs>